Well, welcome. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Richard, um, also Dean Montavon and Melissa Norris, and the, the provost for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate. My name is Elaine Hollinsby, and I'm a professor in the Lindner College of Business in the Department of Management, and my area of research is in organizational behavior. So typically with the kind of identity issues I'm interested in are those related to occupation or organization. So when you see the where is the me and the we, the we will be the organization or the occupation. Um, and my part of the presentation starts out kind of at a micro level, and then Amy and Jeff will begin the ascent and get us up to 30,000 feet with a more macro level view of identity. Okay, so I'd like to begin with an exercise right off the bat. And so what I'm gonna do is this is an exercise that's done in silence. And I'd like you to stand up when I read a description with which you identify. Uh, so you'll stand up when I read a word or a phrase with which you identify. Then after a short time, I'll ask you to sit down. And I want you to pay attention to what you're feeling and observing during the exercise. And you can, and you should, actually look around the room uh, to see who's standing to learn about your audience members. Okay, so I'm gonna sit down so I can participate. All right. Um, so will all of those here who have blonde hair please stand? Blonde hair. My apologies, some of you just got your laughs loaded with food. Please sit down. Uh, will all those who have served in the military please stand? Please sit down. Will all those who are professors please stand? Please sit down. Will all those who are a wife please stand? Please sit down. Will all of those who have green eyes please stand? Please sit down. Will all of those who prefer to live in or ever have lived in a small town or on a farm Please stand. Please sit down. Will all those who are Chinese please stand? Please sit down. Will all those who screw off jar lids for others please stand? Please sit down. Will all those who ask others to screw off jar lids for you, please stand. Please sit down. Will all those who are a brother, please stand. Please sit down. Will all those who played golf by the time you were 15, please stand. Please sit down. If you've ever had a job that most people would consider dirty work, please stand. Please sit down. If you like to garden, please stand. Please sit down. If you're a Christian, please stand. Please sit down. If any of you grew up hearing your parents talk about not having enough money for food, please stand. Please sit down. If you're a member of a book club, please stand. Please sit down. If you're a victim of war or terror, please stand. Please sit down. If you're 40 to 49 years of age, please stand. Please sit down. If you've regularly attended productions at the conservatory, please stand. Please sit down. Well, okay, the purpose of this exercise was twofold. Um, first of all, each word I read is in some way identity related. And so I'm hopeful that it gets you in the frame of mind of thinking about your own identity. And the second reason is to give you an opportunity to reflect on some questions. Uh, so the first one is, 
How did you feel when you were the only one or one of few standing for a given category? Sometimes um, when you hold a relatively unique identity, it can produce a lot of emotions, and those can be pride or it can be more discomforting emotions. Um, how about if a category with which you identified was not red, but other types were? For example, I read brother, but I didn't read sister. Um, I read professor, but I didn't read staff. I read Christian, and I didn't read person of another uh, religious orientation. Did you feel ambivalent or, or unsure about whether to stand for any category? Because sometimes identities aren't particularly clear. And also, sometimes our identity, identities are ones which we don't particularly want to disclose publicly. With which category did you identify the most? Uh, some identities are more important to us, and we draw on them more in defining who we are. And that's really what this presentation is about. Um, typically, I would let you all respond to these questions. If you want to come back to them during the participation part, I'd be more than happy to. Um, my presentation deals with an area of identity called social identity. And according to this area, there are two composite parts to identity. One of them is personal identity. So when I read things like that were traits, like 40 to 49, or uh, that you were, had green eyes, or that you were interested in gardening, that would be a personal part of your identity. We also have social identities comprised of social groups we belong to. Those can be ethnic groups. Those can be uh, gender groups. Um, we have relationships that we have that help form my ident our identity. I wouldn't be a mother without my two sons, so that's a relational identity. And my interest is more in occupations and organizations because we draw on them in defining who we are as well. And they make identity claims on us. So as you can see, personal and social identity here are pretty well balanced. Uh, but sometimes this happens. And in this case, we have imbalance and the collective or the we outweighs other aspects of who you are. And again, I'm particularly interested in how occupations and organizations do that. Um, okay, so the issue that I'm dealing with today is how do people negotiate their unique individual identities in the face of strong social demands toward a collective, a shared collective identity? Um, I've done research in this area and we've identified some tensions. And so I'm gonna talk about some of these tensions that people experience uh, when they're faced with multiple identities between personal and social identity. And the first one is identity intrusion. And that's when an occupation or an organization intrudes to an extent that you're not comfortable uh, on other aspects of who you are. That would be called identity intrusion and I'll give you some examples. And then over-identification is when you, in particular, uh, get more of who you are from what you do, from your occupation and from your organization. And we call that over-identification, meaning that there's more of you that's from your occupation and organization than other parts of you. And then finally, identity transparency. To what extent can you be who you are uh, when you're at work or when you're um, in your occupation or your organization? So those are the tensions that I'm gonna be dealing with, and again, I'll give you some examples as we go through. So let's begin with identity intrusion. Some occupations are just plain greedy. Some organizations are just plain greedy. Um, and this is a quote by Kozier that says, they seek exclusive and undivided loyalty and attempt to reduce the claims of competing roles and status positions on those they wish to encompass within their boundaries. Their demands on the person are omnivorous. So the nature of the occupation or the nature of the organization to some extent contributes to how well you can balance identities. Some occupations are just flat out ask you to submit, to surrender, and to succumb. Um, so to describe the second tension, which is over-identification, I'm gonna begin with a description of identification. And that's the part of your identity that you derive from your associ association with a social group. Um, and there are many social groups. I mentioned some of them on the first slide. But here I'm looking at uh, the organization or the occupation. And identification is the extent to which there's overlap between your identity and the social group's identity. So here's a picture to illustrate. First of all, you've got self and you've got the occupation or the organization. So I derive some of who I am 
by my association with UC. And if somebody asks me who I am, one of the first things out of my mouth is, I'm a professor at UC. So you can see that I'm deriving part of who I am by my association with the organization. And that's a good thing. Overall, that's a good thing. However, when you get the condition called over-identification, um, it can have a dark side. Um, so over-identification is when too much of an individual's identity is lost to other influences. Um, it's strongly correlated with work addiction. And um, again, it's in the eye of the beholder. So now our diagram looks more like this, right? And some of you might say, so what? Um, okay, so um, it's really in the eye of the beholder. Um, some people are comfortable with this, and they wouldn't consider themselves in a state that was uncomfortable. They would be called integrators. Some people would like more of a diverse portfolio. Um, any Star Trek fans in the crowd? Anybody knows the Borg from Star Trek? Okay. Well, the Borg in Star Trek is a fictional organism that tries to assimilate anyone with whom it comes into contact. And here's a, here's a quote. We are the Borg. Lower your shields. Surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Resistance is futile. There is no me, only we. And here's Captain Picard being assimilated, I assume. Um, I've done work with the Episcopal Church for the last 10 years, and I have two colleagues who I work with, Matthew Sheep from Illinois State and Glenn Kreiner from Penn State. And they're an ideal population in which to study this balance between personal and social identities. First of all, they can marry, unlike Catholic priests. And one priest told us one time, there's two times I stood up before an altar and promised to put that thing first in my life. One was ordination and one was marriage. Uh, so they balance identities to a particularly interesting extent. Um, some of you might have followed in the news a couple weeks ago, there was a, an athlete, Junior Sehow, who a former pro football player who was found dead of a presumed a suicide, a presumably of suicide. Uh, obviously there were a lot of factors involved, but I was impressed by the number of quotes that talked about this idea of over-identification. Well, here's one from our priests. It's like when you build a wall and it all depends on one brick. If you pull that out, it all comes tumbling down. Over-involvement in the parish, doing too much, doing too many things, having all my creative thoughts go into what would be nifty to do in the parish, not having any energy left to think about any other part of my life. Um, so you can see there, the idea of having one brick is an interesting one. Um, and here's Junior Seau. And in the press, a lot of the comments about his life went something like this. My favorite player is dead. I always worried about how someone as passionate about football as Junior Seau would handle life after football. I wondered if there was anything he could do to fill the void player's face after the cheering stops. He was troubled trying to find his lot in life after football. Again, over-identification, pull one brick out. Um, identity transparency, again, is the extent to which you feel you can be yourself uh, in, and be in your occupation. Sometimes that's called passing. So not being able to be yourself or the real you um, to different stakeholders in your life there's a tension, this is again a quote from a priest in our study, there's a tension that I've talked about and thought about a lot, having to do with a sense that I'm, who I am is a little more joyful and fun and carefree and maybe even reckless than I think priests are allowed to be. That part of me has really been kept under wraps all these years, these 10 years. So this person is passing on a careless, carefree part of his identity. Um, but we saw a lot of priests who pass on their priestly identity and choose where, whether or not, for example, to wear their collar. I've shared some extreme cases here, um, the Borg, priests, a pro athlete, and you might be asking, is this relevant to me? But many of you stood when I said the word professor, and are professors also vulnerable to identity intrusion? Can the occupation be all encompassing? There are, are identity markers in the priesthood, um, they call each other father, they have the title bishop, well we have titles as professors also, and we have degrees that are identity markers. There's a rite of passage called ordination. Uh, which some priests believe is an ontological shift that occurs in their identity. Um, we have a rite of passage called tenure. Um, I'm not sure it was an ontological shift, but I tell you what, I think it was identity shaping. Um, <laughs> have you ever felt like passing, like passing on your professorial identity? I was on a plane a couple of months ago on a transatlantic trans flight, and I made the mistake of saying to the person next to me, I'm a professor of organizational behavior at the University of Cincinnati. So for the next three hours, I heard about every single dysfunction in that organization. Team dysfunctions, individual dysfunctions, and I thought, why didn't I pass? So there might be cases in which you pass on your identity as well. 
And do we over-identify? Well, I know some professors who retire, and they keep an office on campus, and they still come to campus. Um, you know, one brick? I don't know. So to summarize, um, there's a tension between personal and uh, social identities. Too much me leads to isolation, whereas too much we can actually lead, lead to a loss of uniqueness. Um, so what can be done? This is actually a very stripped down model uh, from the work that we did. And there are forces that push people toward integrating with the collective and forces that push people toward differentiating from the collective. And again, it's, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. There's a just right point um, that we call optimal balance. We also um, talked with priests about how they manage the balance between personal and social identities. And they had several strategies. Um, I put a question mark on this one, but some of them were quite effective at differentiating or segmenting the priestly aspect of their identity. Um, many were good at setting limits on the occupation or on the uh, organization in which they were working. Some created an identity hierarchy. Rather than relying on the situa situationally um, salient identity, create a hierarchy, family first, for example. And then many of the priests enacted ephemeral roles. Some of them were um, poker players, and they talked about that as being a way to step out of that role of the priesthood. So my time is up, and I hope this has provoked you to think about tensions in your own identity, as well as the identity work in which you engage. Thank you. <laughs>